reminded me that uh, there was a time not so long ago when uh, identity theft was absolutely unheard of. Uh, my grandpa and grandma Palmquist lived in a little Swedish farming village uh, community in southwestern Iowa, Yashur Yabetcha, and, uh, and uh, we would go to the register, the cash register, to pay for groceries in the little town grocer, and grandpa would ask the, the grocer for a blank check from a stack of checkbooks representing all the area banks. Now, when I say blank, it was completely blank. There were no, th th there was no names on it. There were no account numbers, no anything. Um, his blank, his, his was the first national bank of Essex, Iowa, and it was the pink one over there. And uh, he would simply sign the check and let the grocer fill in the rest. And to top it off, Grandpa never kept track of his account, the amount of money in his bank account. That's the bank's job, he would say. Uh, and even at seven or eight, I had some pretty strong auditor instincts in me. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking to myself, I told him many times, Grandpa, someone's going to rip you off. Someone's going to rip you off. But amazingly, no one ever did. No one ever did. Grandpa's money and his identity were absolutely secure. Now, millions of us have probably been the victims of identity theft. Maybe some of you have. It's a very unsettling feeling uh, to be robbed or to have somebody pretending to be you. Uh, there was that movie that we saw the beginning of that was all about that. And uh, uh, not to mention the, the huge amounts of, of time and energy and resources that it takes to reestablish our identities afterwards. Thieves go to great lengths to steal our identity. Now this morning, and over these next few weeks, I want us to consider that there is an identity that is even more important than that which is represented by your nine and 12 digit numbers. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then God wants you to know that as far as he is concerned, no one can take your true identity from you. And this morning, we're going to consider one verse that is just very poignant. We're going to have lots of other scripture throughout the whole thing, but this is sort of the theme verse of the morning. 1 John 3, 1. It says, See how very much <coughs> excuse me, our Father loves us, for He calls us His children, and that's what we are. And so today we're going to hopefully discover or rediscover the source of our true identity. And we're going to consider that there are some threats to rip us off. And finally, we're going to learn what a lockdown defense to protect our identity is all about. First of all, we're going to search for our identity. We're going to look at identity search or identity sought. I was reading in the uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the news uh, about something that took place many, uh, about uh, thir 13 years ago. Uh, it was August 31st, 2004. A man was found badly beaten, naked, and covered with fire ant bites outside of Burger King in Richmond Hill, Georgia. He did not have a wallet or any form of identification on him. He could not remember his name, where he was from, or anything else about himself. Doctors said he suffered from what's called retrograde amnesia. Uh, he took the name Benjamin Kyle due to the fact that it had the same initials as Burger King. Think about that. <laughs> His story became very, very well known. In fact, he went on Dr. Phil, CNN, ABC, and other news, syndicated news, news networks looking for any clues. Do any of you know me? Do you know my identity? The mystery continued from 2004 until the year 2015 when through the use of DNA matching and, and all sorts of uh, things that were, have been inputted into the system over, the, over the, those 11 years, that he actually found some fam family members. 
Think about it, though. Just imagine if that were you. Just imagine if that were you. To wake up tomorrow and have no idea who you are. None whatsoever. That everything from your identity, from your hard drive, so to speak, has been erased. And you don't know how to find it. That would be a very scary proposition, wouldn't it? To be in that situation. See, when we are born into the world, we're, we're born into a family, and the family defines us, it, at least for a while. One of the greatest gifts that parents and grandparents give their children and their grandchildren is the promise of security and the promise of an identity. You are mine. We belong together. We love you, no matter what. Kids need that so desperately, but kids of all ages, including us, need it desperately too. Our family identity is vital. But even more vital is our identity in God. This is an important theological statement, actually. Uh, each of us were created in what's called the Imago Dei. The Imago Dei. That's the Latin phrase for image of God. We're created in the image of God. And what that means is image of God, you can read it on your note page, is the, is the Christian doctrine that asserts that human beings are created in God's image and therefore have inherent value independent of their utility or their function. We were created by God, for God full of potential, full of opportunity. You are no accident. The psalmist summarizes this so beautifully in Psalm 139. He says, you know me from the inside out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made, bit by bit, how I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you have watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared were, were all prepared before I'd even lived one day. Then we discover God's love. Well, when we discover God's love like that, he calls us to trust him with our lives. So we not only have a born identity, but the scriptures call it a, the second birth is a born again identity that defines who we are in Jesus Christ. You see, knowing what God says and knows about me and about you, I don't have to fret how I look, how many friends I have, or what my social standing is, because I know that I am already loved. That's a double underline done deal. God's love is one size fits all. And our identity in Christ is a free gift to anyone by faith, just like I described before. His love is the source of identity. It's too bad we can't all live where my grandparents once lived in the thriving metropolis of Essex, Iowa, population 795. And wouldn't it be nice if all of our identities were as safe as those blank checks were? In, the gro in that grocery store that no one would ever try to steal the precious treasure that is our identity in Christ. Yet we know that identity thieves abound, even identity thieves that try to steal our real identity. And that leads us to the second part of our consideration this morning. We've talked about identity sought or identity secure, but now this is identity stolen. Identity stolen. See, we live in a world that also attempts to define and redefine us in many different ways. We're defined by what we have, by where we live, by who we know, by what we look like, by what we have done or what you can do for me or what I can do for you. Yet, you see, the Apostle Paul wrote this in Philippians 3. He says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. God tells us that our true identity is what? Defined by our relationship with him. However, too often we allow ourselves to think 
that our self-identity is to be defined by our relationships with others and by what they think about us. Think about it. When the first day you went to school, we began to seek identities in different ways around popularity, around academics, around sports or drama or other groups of people that we would hang out with. And then there comes the time when we have girlfriends and boyfriend identities. I remember how hard it was breaking up with a girlfriend in my early, early years because I still wanted to be that person's boyfriend. We become so defined by that relationship with another person that we forget what our relationship above all others, what the relationship above all others is that truly defines us. See, allowing others to define us is, 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 is very, very destructive whether we're a student or an adult. We want so much to be accepted, so we allow other people to define us and to set our focus. And I see people all the time who allow other people to, to live their lives for them. Some of us will do just about anything, and we will turn into just about anybody in order to be accepted. Why do you think gangs flourish? Why do you think people are so readily willing to give up their body, sexually speaking? It's because there's this need to be accepted and valued. Why do we care so much about what other people think or say about us? Why do we end up in codependent patterns and relationships where we just need to be needed? It's because we're looking to belong. We're looking to be accepted. We're relational beings at the core of who we are. Relationships involve people, and people will eventually let us down. That's just the way it works. Even as healthy and good as relationships can be, they don't possess an unfailing love. Mark my words. You know this very well. People, even the closest people to you, they're going to betray you sometime. People will break promises. People will break vows. They, people will exclude you. They'll reject you. They'll wound you. They'll disappoint you. I think many years ago, Carol King and James Taylor summarized it well in a, in a, in a song that's probably in all of our minds right now. It, just read some of the words. It says, hey, hey, ain't it good to know that you've got a friend? People can be so cold. They'll hurt you and desert you. Well, they'll take your soul if you let them. Oh yeah, but don't you let them. Just call out my name and you know wherever I am, I'm co I'll come running to see you again. You see, if you're depending on another person to do what only God can do, if you're depending on that one other person to complete you, then you're going to get hurt by that somebody. And that person who was, you were expecting to be your everything, all that acceptance, all that security, all that significance that you've been craving will all be gone. And that's how our identities get stolen. The Apostle Paul is about as clear as you can be when he says this in Colossians 2.10. He says, so you are all complete through what? Your union with Christ. You and I are complete through our union with Christ. Part of who I am is certainly my connection with others. I'm Betsy's husband, and I'm Sarah's and David's and Daniel's dad. And I want you to know that I love Betsy very much. I love her more yesterday than, uh, excuse me, I love her more than... <laughs> I got some digging to do now. So, <laughs> I love her more than yesterday, and and it keeps growing. We've been we've been married for 24 and a sixth years, and uh, she's my soulmate. She's my best friend. I'd rather hang out with her than with anybody else. But make no mistake about it: as wonderful as she is, she does not complete me. 
and I know this will certainly not come to a shock to anyone else in here too, that she would tell you that I don't complete her either. And for the last 23 of the 24 years of our marriage, Betsy and I have also defined ourselves as parents. And from what I hear, we'll always be parents. But this weekend, we're starting a brand new chapter too as we move Daniel into his first year of college. You see, whether it's spouses or children or good friends, we don't complete each other. God does. God does. So don't let others steal your identity, even those most close to you. So how do we defend against this thing that we call identity theft? Do we need a good antivirus program? Is that the answer? Or do we need that crazy thing called LifeLock that they always advertise on, on television? Well, no, God's got a better answer to that. We're going to call it identity sealed. Identity sealed. My parents used to remind my brothers and me when we would go out, when we went to college, when we went to school, when we'd go out with our friends, and they would often say the words, remember who you are. Remember who you are. And that's what we do too with our three children. Remember who you are. And truthfully, it's more than just a, being a part of the Whitcup family. It's much more than that. It's the identity of the one who lives inside you. And it's symbolized when we're baptized. We make the sign of the cross on each person's forehead. And you remember what we say? We say, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. See, if you've trusted Christ, there are so many powerful images in Scripture that help us understand our true identity. First of all, you're a new person. You're a new person. The Bible says that you belong to Christ. If you follow Jesus, you are a new creation. From 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old is gone and a new life has begun. Those words, new creation or new person, mean that you are a whole new being that never existed before. A whole new being that never existed before. Secondly, you are a child of God. We've talked about that one already. First John 1 or John 1.12 says, But to all who believed him and accepted, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. Through your faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord and your leader, it's brought you into his, his, his family. The question is this morning, have you trusted your life to him? That's the most important, important decision you'll ever make. God has adopted you. He, he wants us to love him back because he's already accepted you as a, as a child. And then finally, one of the other images, there's so many more, but the, the three I picked this morning, the last one is the word saint. Actually, you are simultaneously a sinner and a saint. Simultaneously a sinner and a saint. Christians are called saints 240 times in the Bible. Paul, an apostle by the will of God to the saints in Ephesus. The faithful in Christ Jesus. Saying does not mean that we don't do anything, don't do things wrong anymore. Absolutely not. Remember, I said we're saint and sinner at the, exactly the same time. We are we are saints because God's given us a free gift, and He says, "Now I've called you. You are blessed to what? Blessed to be a blessing." blessed to be a blessing in the world. And that's what grace is all about. God at work within us. See, over these next few weeks, we're going to look at some more of the passages that, that give us a clear picture of our identity if we really follow Jesus. 
I need to be reminded of this and so do you. And that's why we need to literally wallpaper the walls of our mind with scripture lest we forget our identity. But this morning as we conclude, I want to ask you a question. There's actually some lines on your note page and there's pens around if you choose to, to use that or maybe you just want to let this roll around in your mind. But my call to each of us is don't let others rob you of your identity. Don't let others rob you of your identity. Listen to your God. Listen to your creator, your source of life and your best friend. Listen to what God says. So here's the question we're going to take a couple minutes just to have some quiet time this morning. What relations are robbing you, are robbing me of my true identity? What relationships are robbing you and me of my true identity? Could it be a close relationship? A parent, a spouse, children? Could it be something in the workplace? that's doing it? Could it be social media where people try to one-up one another all the time? What is that relationship that you're allowing to rob you this morning of your true identity in Jesus Christ? Just take a few moments with the piano playing in the background to, to think about that. And then we're going to sing.